Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I am your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I appreciate all of you hanging out with us as we are rolling through the Wednesday edition of the program. Lots to get to. Breaking news every day, chaotically in every direction, as seems to be the case. Basically, I think it's going to be the case all the way through uh, the election in a little bit less than four months. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Trump v. Biden on the golf course um, and, uh, and more. But right off the top, I thought this was a really big deal. Um, George Clooney, Hollywood celebrity star, who helped raise nearly $30 million for Joe Biden just three weeks ago, a few hours ago, published an opinion piece in the New York Times editorial calling on Joe Biden to step down. And I think, I understand some of you out there that are like, I don't care. Why should I care what George Clooney thinks about anything? He's just an actor. What does he know? Uh, I don't know why you would pay attention to that. I understand there's lots of reactions of that magnitude. Well, I'm going to explain to you why I think this is actually pretty significant. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through why I believe that. But first, let me tell you what he said. I read the New York Times every day, so you don't have to. I read the Wall Street Journal every day. I read the Washington Post every day. All three of those newspapers every single day, cover to cover, I try to make sure that I'm aware of everything that they're saying. Um, so Clooney uh, has a uh, piece up, and he has this to say. This is, to me, the crux of the most important part. Uh, the one battle he cannot win, meaning Joe Biden, is the fight against time. None of us can. It's devastating to say it, but the Joe Biden I was with three weeks ago at the fundraiser was not the Joe big effing deal Biden of 2010. He wasn't even the Joe Biden of 2020. This is the key line. He was the same man we all witnessed at the debate. That's the most important line in this whole piece. He was the same man we all witnessed at the debate. What the Democrats who are protecting Biden still are saying right now is Biden just had a bad night. He isn't like he was on June 27th very often. He is actually still very much in, con in control. Clooney Three weeks ago at that debate, do you remember when Joe froze, when his answers were halting, when he seemed out of sorts? Do you remember when Biden froze on the stage and Obama had to walk him off? And people said, oh, you're making too much of that, Clay. I actually got attacked. People said, oh, that's a cheap fake. Oh, that's a misrepresentation. They're just good friends. Clooney's telling you everything I told you after that fundraiser, yeah, it was all true. He continues. This is Clooney's words. Was he tired? Yes. A cold? Maybe. But our party leaders need to stop telling us that 51 million people didn't see what we just saw. Uh, and he says, basically... We have to collectively hold our breath or turn down the volume whenever we see the president walk off Air Force One or walk back to a mic to answer an unscripted question. Um, and he's saying it's disingenuous at best to argue Democrats have already spoken with their vote when we just received new and upsetting information. We all think Republicans should abandon their nominee now that he's been convicted of 34 felonies. That's new and upsetting information as well. I'm reading from George Clooney's editorial. Top Democrats, and he names them, Chuck Schumer, Hakeem Jeffries, Nancy Pelosi, and senators, representatives, and other candidates need to ask this president to voluntarily step aside. Uh, let's hear from governors as well. Let's agree that the candidates not attack one another, 
but in the short time we have, focus on what will make the country soar. Would it be messy? Yes. But would it enliven our party and wake up voters who before the June debate had already checked out? Yes. So he doesn't even say that he thinks Kamala Harris should be elevated. He says there should be a debate featuring Wes Moore, Kamala Harris, Gretchen Whitmer, Gavin Newsom, Andy Bashir, J.B. Pritzker, and others. Basically, wide open, free for all. Let's see who the nominee should actually be. Okay, what's going on here? Two big points. One, this is not the same guy. So any argument out there that Biden is on his game and boy, it was just a bad night, that's a lie. No one with a functional brain can make that argument anymore. Two, Biden's losing. That's what this is all about. There's no argument that Democrats expect that Joe Biden is going to lose on November 5th. If Biden were winning, none of this would have happened. The seven congressional Democrats who've called for Biden to step down wouldn't have happened. The George Clooney editorial, the double New York Times editorials, all these other left-wing newspapers, none of them would have said a word about this. What's going on is Biden's losing and Biden doesn't have the mental and physical capacity to be president. That's top line. What's going on behind the scenes? George Clooney doesn't write this by himself. George Clooney is boys with Obama. George Clooney is buddies with all of the top figures inside of the Democrat Party. Clooney is saying what a lot of them are afraid to say. I would even suggest to you, I don't think George Clooney would say this without a tacit nod from Barack Obama. That is, I think what is happening now is Barack Obama is beginning to pull the threads behind the scenes and driving the anti-Joe Biden train without actually having to speak out yet. Now, here's the question. And I said this last night. Some of you may have seen it with Jesse Waters on Fox News. There are only two people, in my opinion, who can end Biden's ability to be the nominee. Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. They are the two two-term living Democrat presidents that are out there, in theory, they can't run for anything, any other office. They're already been to the apex of the White House. They know better than anybody the mental and physical challenges inherent in being president for eight years. Just look at the photos. Look at how much that job ages everybody, okay? They know better than anybody what this job takes. I'm telling you, that is the only way Joe Biden gets forced out. And this George Clooney editorial is hinting, hey, Obama might be about to drop the hammer. Now, I want for Joe Biden to be the nominee because Biden, in my opinion, should have to stand on his awful record. He should have to defend the choices that he's made. And the American public should get to make a decision between two incumbents, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. That feels fair to me. But I think Democrats know that Trump is going to win. Why do I think that? Let me hit you with a couple of more data points. I was reading this morning, and I want to make sure I get the citations right. This is from the New York Times this morning. Uh, their um, Nate Cohn Nate Cohen, Nate Cohn, Nate Cohn, I think, Times chief political analyst, said, July, it's getting early late. What do I mean by that? A lot of people sit around, they say, well, we're still 110, 15 days, whatever the exact math is, away from November 5th, away from election day. It's under four months. 
but there's still time. Still have all of July, August, September, October. There's still a lot of time, as people try to argue. Well, it's actually not true based on recent history. And let me read you from what I read this morning uh, in the New York Times. Biden led Donald Trump four years ago. At this point in time, he did. Hillary led Trump eight years ago at this point in time. She went on to win the popular vote, even though she lost the Electoral College. Obama led in the July polls in 2008 and 2012. Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan both led in the summers of 96 and 84 re-election campaigns they would go on to win. There are examples of candidates who've overcome, I'm reading from the Times, weak summer polling, including George W. Bush in 2004, but Biden today looks to be in worse position than any recent come-from-behind winner. Quote, there are no precedents in recent memory for presidents to have approval ratings like Biden's who go on to win re-election. Doesn't mean that it can't happen, and I think that's very significant, but it does mean that it's highly unlikely. Here was where the real clear politics polling averages were on this day for the past 20 years. In 2020, Biden was up nine points on Trump. Biden would go on, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, to win by around three points, I think, was the final margin. Look that up for me if you would. Same thing 2016. Hillary was up over uh, Trump 4.7 points. Hillary would go on to win uh, by two and a half points, I think, nationwide. I think that was the final tally. Again, Adam, if you'll look up the final popular vote tally in those elections. 2012. Obama was up two and a half. He ended up winning by around that amount. 2008, Obama was up by four points. He ended up winning, I think, by around that or a little bit more. Uh, 2004, John Kerry was up, but Bush came back to win a very close race. Point on this, and this is from the Real Clear Politics guys. This is the first time in 24 years that the Republican nominee has led after July 4th going into the Republican National Convention and the Democrat National Convention. I think that's pretty significant. I think that is very, very significant. Now, a couple of other things that I think are uh, also uh, significant out there worth contemplating here. The Trump team is acknowledging, this is from Axios, that they now believe that the map has emerged and these are the swing states. This is from this morning in Axios in order from hardest to easiest to win. Um, And so let me hit you with that. According to the Trump team, hardest to easiest, Pennsylvania won, Wisconsin two, Michigan 3, Georgia 4, North Carolina 5, Nevada and Arizona 6 and 7. So, by the way, I'm going to talk about the flip side, the Big Ten states in a moment, but actually what stood out to me at first was the Trump team is more confident even in Nevada and Arizona than they are in Georgia and North Carolina. That's a pretty big statement because the Trump team is saying, hey, we feel like we are really strong in the Southwest, both in the states of Nevada and Arizona. I wouldn't have bet. I would have said that I thought they were even more confident in the South. Instead, Georgia and North Carolina, where I think they're quite confident, actually they're less confident there than they are in Nevada and Arizona. But let's go to the Big Ten states. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan in that order. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. Now, they said, the team did, Pennsylvania's first because it's the biggest swing state and because Biden has to have it. 
really what you're looking at when you see these numbers is Biden only has one path, essentially, to re-election right now. And it is he has to sweep Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. If he does not do that, then Trump's going to be the president. All Trump has to do is peel away one of those three states. And certainly, look, he could make a run in Maine, make a run in New Hampshire, Virginia, New Mexico, New Jersey, uh, New York, uh, Minnesota. There are a lot of other states, Colorado, uh, New Mexico, like I said, Arizona and Nevada, they feel very confident. There are a lot of other states out there that are kind of teetering on competitiveness. But if Trump wins one of Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, or Michigan, it's game over. I actually thought it was interesting that the Trump team is the most confident of those three based on the order that they put them in, in Michigan. That surprised me. Um, I think it speaks to Jewish voters and Arab voters because of what's going on in Israel, a place, by the way, where I'm going to be in a couple of weeks. I think it speaks to how uncomfortable they are about things there. Just worth contemplating, thinking about it. Again, this is Axios putting out that data. Reason why I share all that data with you, swing state data rankings, um, everything else that's going on, the Clooney editorial. I didn't even hardly talk about it, but George Stephanopoulos, the story, oh, he got caught on video by somebody, TMZ gets it, saying that he doesn't think Biden can serve four more years. Who does? I didn't think that was that much of a scandal. Um, I don't think there's any way that Biden can serve four more years. I'm not sure that Biden can serve six more months, which is how much time he has left on his uh, term. Okay, a couple of other things. Um, Golf challenge. I loved it. I thought it was vintage Trump. Trump had a rally at South Florida at Doral. By the way, apologies, I got that wrong. I was told Tua was going to be there. He wasn't whiffed by me. I owned it. I shared it. Uh, I got that wrong. Mainstream admitting when you get things wrong, there's one that I just got wrong. Um, Trump golf challenge. He said that he would play Biden at Doral, one of the courses that he owns, that he would play him 18 holes, that he would give Biden 10 strokes on each nine, that is 20 total strokes. And if Biden beat him, that he would donate, Trump would, a million dollars to a charity of Biden's choice. Charity's probably Hunter Biden. I went on Jesse Waters last night and said, I would also put up my own million dollars and say, I'll give a million dollars to Joe Biden if he beats Trump with a 20-stroke lead as well. Let me also add this. It's brilliant. Because I believe that if Trump and Biden played 18 holes, it would be the most watched golf event in United States television history. Let me repeat that. If Biden were willing to golf against Trump, I believe it would be the most watched golf event in the history of the United States. Bigger than any Masters, bigger than the Ryder Cup, bigger than the U.S. Open or the British Open or the PGA or any other golf event that has ever aired. I also think it would be useful because I don't believe that even using a golf cart, Joe Biden could attempt 100 shots in four hours in the Florida sun. I don't believe he has the physical ability even with a golf cart, and I think he would have to attempt around 100 shots, maybe 110. Trust me, I know how much energy that takes because that's my usual golf round. You guys have seen my swing. I don't think Joe Biden could do it. I don't think Joe Biden could finish a round of 18 golf holes in South Florida, even being able to use a golf cart to drive him close to his ball. If you can't play 18 holes of golf using a golf cart, I don't think you're physically or mentally capable of being the president of the United States. 
I mean that. Now, there are some exceptions that could arise in the future, right? You could have an FDR-like situation where you have a disabled president, someone who is not able to use his legs, someone who's a war veteran that has lost a leg. I'm not saying that this is dispositive in all cases, but I do believe in the case of Biden, it's a brilliant challenge. The Biden team came back with an awful, pathetic response that was written by a bunch of losers on the Biden campaign. No sense of humor. And remember, Biden challenged Trump first. And as a part of this, Trump also challenged Biden to another debate. No moderators, anytime, place, anywhere. I would be stunned if Biden accepts that. I don't believe that he will because I think he is terrified of being on the stage with Trump again without moderators to protect him. But I thought it was brilliant by Trump to issue that golf challenge. Uh, Okay, let's close out right now. I'm loving House of the Dragon. Loving it. We're in season two. Longtime OutKick viewers know that I was a monster fan of uh, Game of Thrones. Would do live reaction videos. I would like to be doing live reaction videos of these episodes. I'm just gone all summer. I wish they hadn't put it on in the middle of the summer. Um, I'm up in Milwaukee next week, and then I'm down at a uh, at a big charity event or a big uh, fundraising event in um, in South Florida. And then I've got to go to Israel, and then I'm out in Colorado. I'm on the road for basically the rest of the, the House of the Dragon season, so I'm not going to have access on the weekends to, uh, to, to my usual camera crew. I got to tell you, though, I thought that it was and is phenomenal so far. Um, I thought season two, episode four, was the best of all of the House of Dragons so far. The one criticism, maybe it's a dual criticism that I would have, there's no humor. It's a very dark show. The villains are incredibly well-defined. There aren't that many likable people, and there is no great humor. It's a very different show, but Succession, which is also about who's going to take over the corporate throne, is hysterical. It's really funny, smartly written, obviously set in the present day media company's world that I live in, but it's so well done, really sharp and funny, fantastically well written with the humor. Doesn't mean there's not dark parts. Much of Succession is also very dark, but where's the humor in House of the Dragon? Game of Thrones actually had really good humor with Tyrion, uh, with the Hound, Uh, Jamie Lannister actually had a a decent little dry wit about him. There was many times that you would watch a Game of Thrones episode and you might find yourself laughing. Samuel Tarly, somewhat funny as well. Even though it's dark and gruesome and, and about the quest of power, there were elements that were actually very funny written into that show. Have you laughed in House of the Dragon at all. I can't recall doing it. It's very serious. So my number one criticism would be we need better humor mixed in with all of the seriousness. I would argue the villains may be as good or better than Game of Thrones. Aegon um, and, or sorry, Aemon and, uh, and Damon are amazing villains. So well-crafted Really, really fantastic, both of those guys. Um, And then I would say probably the two women, Alicent and Rhaenyra, are supposed to be the most likable of the cast members. I don't find them particularly likable. I think we need a little bit more of a rooting interest. I'm not saying the person has to be good. Certainly good is very relative in the Game of Thrones universe, But I do think that would be somewhat helpful um, in terms of just having someone that we could like. Jon Snow back in the day was an incredibly likable character. Who's the Jon Snow of this series? I don't know that I have one that I root for that I believe would make a lot of sense. So 
I love the show. Season two, much better than season one. Season uh, two, episode four, which just aired on Sunday, is, I think, the best episode so far. I would give it a solid eight and a half out of ten. Um, I liked season one okay. This one, <coughs> I believe, is infinitely better so far. Uh, so anyway, that is my review of House of the Dragon. All right. I love all of you. I'll be back tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel. DBAP unless you need to SBAP. This has been OutKick, the show.